Well, I am glad to have the opportunity to be here and to share with you this morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you go ahead and be opening them up to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh, we're going to look at a few verses there. Uh, while you're doing that, I want to ask you a question. Uh, have you ever heard the phrase, uh, you, or maybe have used it yourself, uh, when a situation arises, somebody says, or you say, this is not my circus and these are not my monkeys. Anybody? Anybody use that and know what the deal is? Uh, there, there is some sort of drama that is going on in somebody's life, either at work or uh, uh, you know, on your kid's ball team or maybe even the extended family. Uh, and in this drama, you look at it and you say, that's not my circus, that's, those are not my monkeys. And by that, we're saying, that is not really my problem to deal with. Right? Uh, and what we want to do is run away and not have anything to do with it. We don't even want to hear it. Uh, maybe we think, well, I've got my own problems to deal with. I don't even want to begin to try and deal with yours. Uh, but sometimes there are situations around us uh, that, that are going on uh, that, that we do need to get involved in. There are times that we do need to say something about the situations that are going on around us in the people's lives that are close to us. I want to ask you, what are the situations around you that make you want to run away? What are the, what are the things that happen that make you want to say, this is not my circus? I want to share a couple of, of mine with you this morning uh, as, we, as we kind of move our way into towards the text. Uh, I want to ask you this. Have you ever known someone who was so opposed to Christianity that the only thing they ever did was tear it down, try and uh, obliterate any idea that somebody could believe this? Uh, seem to be on a crusade to destroy it and prevent other people from believing it. Do we share the gospel with somebody like that? Or do we hold our tongue out of fear of starting an argument? Have you ever known someone who was so down and discouraged that they did not think they could go on with life? Maybe they had lost a loved one or they have experienced some severe physical malady. Maybe they've had a string of, uh, of bad luck and hard circumstances and there just don't seem to be words to say to comfort them. What do you do? What do you say? Do you say anything at all? Has someone you have known been living a life of unrepentant sin and it breaks your heart to the point of tears? You are torn up on the inside about the things you see going on in people's lives. What can you say or do that is going to get them to turn away from their life of sin? Maybe you think it won't do any good and you avoid the conversation altogether. Anybody been there? Anybody feel these kinds of situations where there are just things that seem to be over us and above us and beyond our ability? I want to ask you this morning, what if I told you that God has a plan for these situations and that it is for you to talk to them? God's plan is to use you. The words that we say can and do make a difference in the lives of the people that are around us. Nancy Guthrie is a lady whose life has been touched by tragedy. Uh, due to some genetic defects, she has lost two children because of birth defects. She went on to write a book uh, entitled, What Grieving People Wish You Knew About What Really Helps and What Really Hurts. She writes in the book, she says, I remember well what a friend who had lost a child told me, told me shortly before her daughter Hope died. It wasn't so much what people said that hurt, she said. What hurt was when people said nothing at all. All too soon I discovered what she meant. The silence that seemed to scream that my daughter's life didn't merit a mention. And oh, how it hurt. Another author 
uh, Dr. Charles Hodges wrote a book uh, entitled Good Mood, Bad Mood, which he talks about the, the, the modern day epidemic of, uh, of depression and discouragement and uh, um, bipolar disorder, as people understand it uh, today. And in this book, he discusses the tendency of our modern world that in times of trial and in times of sadness and discouragement and depression, that it's the, the modern world's answer to turn to medicine for help in dealing with things like depression. And let me just say, I don't want to treat this lightly, and I don't want you to think that I'm totally opposed to medicine, uh, and there's a lot involved in this conversation, but I want you to know uh, that there's more to the conversation than just taking medicine. Uh, that, that in this book, he says that among other things, that a large percentage of cases uh, that people would be helped by just having a regular conversation, by talking with someone about their problems, and that would be as much or more effective than taking any kind of medicine. Having a regular conversation. Uh, years gone by, people uh, who were committed to the truth of the Scripture and uh, devoted their lives to understanding and living it out, we uh, uh, called the Puritans, uh, they, they had an idea that when somebody came into their fellowship uh, and their life was one filled with unrepentant sin, there, there was a way that they wanted to do that. And there was a phrase that they used to talk about that. Uh, they talked about loading the conscience with guilt. That as people would come in, they would, they would share from the Scripture how the things that people were doing were wrong. Not in a, not in a self-righteous, uh, condemning sort of way, but more in the sense that they would stand up and they would say that it's horrible to sin, but it's so wonderful to be forgiven. Now, in, in these conversations, there, there are some very heavy and some very weighty ideas to consider. And don't get me wrong, there are a lot of obstacles to overcome. There are a lot of warnings that we need to pay attention to. Personally, in my life, uh, I would say I, I've had a fear of conversations. When I, when I was a, a young uh, child, I, I was very, very shy. I was afraid to talk to people. I would go to school and I would keep to myself and I wouldn't say anything to other people. And, uh, and honestly, shy doesn't really describe me. Uh, shaking in my boots, afraid, what was kind of the, the way that I felt. Even, in, even as I've grown up and outgrown a lot of this, there, there's still times when fear controls me. What if what I say makes them mad? What if what I say causes an argument? What if I, what I say leads to conflict? How about this? What about uh, incompetence? Sometimes uh, I look at the hard conversations I've tried to have in my life, and I think, well, I, I tried to say something that it didn't go very well. Anybody ever done that? You, you're like, I'm going to say something, and it just, it just blows up in our face. Tried it before, and it doesn't go well. What about people that don't listen? I tried to talk to them, and they didn't want to hear what I had to say. So do I, do I say anything if I'm convinced that they're not even going to listen in the first place? Maybe the problem is a problem of knowledge. I don't even know the answers that people are looking for. I don't even know what to say or how to answer the questions that people have. All of these things stand in the way of us being able to have a good, honest, open conversation with people about very hard things. Now, I want to say one thing this morning that I am not talking about is gossip. Now, we all know that when the drama is going on in somebody's life, we would like to go and tell other people about it. Oh, did you hear about the thing that's going on in somebody else's life? Right? That's something we do. We, we, we go to other people and we talk about people. What I'm talking about this morning is not talking about people, but talking to people. Not talking to others about the problems uh, that we see, but to talking to them about what is going on. I want to assure you this morning that the Bible is true when it says that life and death are in the power of the tongue. There is incredible potential for harm or for good when we speak. And we must believe in the power of God and the gospel and its relevance for our lives today. And I say all that to set up the, the, 
uh, conversation we're going to have, the, the time we're going to spend looking at the Word this morning in 2 Corinthians. Because uh, we find in, well, really 1 and 2 Corinthians that Paul addresses a lot of these situations. So the things that we feel today are things that people have been wrestling with and dealing with all throughout time. And Paul himself uh, shares some of these ideas uh, uh, in the books of 1 and 2 Corinthians. Now, uh, before we jump into the text today, I, I want to just kind of say that we're coming into the middle of a conversation. Uh, now, we, we know as we open our Bibles, we're talking about 2 Corinthians. So there has been a lot of information that has gone on between Paul and the Corinthian church before we get to this point. And it's very important to understand because there is a lot of ongoing conversation that Paul addresses in 2 Corinthians. Uh, and I think it's important to note that Paul had a long-standing relationship with these people, that hard conversations happen the best in the context of a relationship. Uh, and so uh, I want you to, as we're looking this morning, understand this is an ongoing conversation. Uh, how, how, what was Paul's relationship with the Corinthians like? Uh, well, he started by, by going there to start a church. And he lived there for an extended period of time. And after he left, uh, he sent a letter back to kind of check in with them and see how things were going. And uh, he had uh, people come from the church to come and tell him how things were going there. And we, we understand that Paul wrote back to them in response to this letter that he had wrote. And actually, uh, the letter that we have, that we have that letter, and that is 1 Corinthians. So there was a letter... And then Paul responds with 1 Corinthians. And then uh, scholars tell us that there's probably another letter in between 1 and 2 Corinthians that Paul had written and interacted with them. And then we had the letter of 2 Corinthians. So we, we possibly have four different letters, four uh, main uh, types of communication that, that Paul has had with the Corinthian church besides sending Timothy and Titus and a few other people kind of to go and check up on this church. And so uh, there's a lot of uh, conversation that's been going on already. And as we come into 2 Corinthians, I want you to understand we're jumping into the middle of conversation. And Paul uh, is very open and honest. In, in 2 Corinthians, Paul openly shares about his own struggles and he addresses their struggles as well. He comforts People who have been afflicted. If you read chapter 1, it talks about uh, the, the pain and the, the trials that Paul had faced. And uh, he, he wanted them to know. But he also, he not only comforts the afflicted, he afflicts those who are comfortable. He has some words of challenge, some words of exhortation, some words of admonishment uh, for people in the church there. We know that the church in Corinth was one of the most problematic churches that Paul dealt with. And in, in the Bible, of all the churches that were addressed, there don't seem to be as many problems in any other church as there is in the church at Corinth. And Paul has written and written and written and written to them to talk to them about the things that they were dealing with. And so as we get to the text this morning, I want you to know our words can have a saving and a sanctifying impact when we speak in the power of the Holy Spirit. I would like to ask you to join me in reading 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 14 and read down through chapter 3, verse 6. Uh, Paul says, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. No, uh, no to one, a fragrance from death to death to another the fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's Word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ, delivered by us, written not with ink, that, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts." 
Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. As we look at these verses this morning, I want you uh, to think with me that when we speak, there are some things that we should know. I, I want to share three of them with you this morning as we are looking at this passage of Scripture. When we speak, first of all, we should know that we are spreading the knowledge of Jesus Christ everywhere we go. In the passage here, it says, Paul is writing, he says that, uh, that in Christ, He always leads us in a triumphal uh, procession. And what is that? What is a triumphal procession? Any of you ever been to a triumphal procession or seen a triumphal procession before? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, really, to get the idea, uh, I, I think there's a movie that was re released recently that kind of has the idea. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the new Aladdin movie that has come out, but uh, there, there's, a, there's a time when uh, Aladdin is coming into this city to win the heart of the princess, and uh, he, he has asked the genie for this, this great big production to be put on as he is coming into the city. Now he's dressed up and he is uh, decked out and he has got uh, musicians and he has animals and it is a spectacle to be seen. And as he is entering the city, of course, the song is on, Make Way for Prince Ali. Prince Ali, mighty is he, Ali Ababwa. And everybody in the city just kind of stops to see what is going on and they're watching this thing take place. And really, this is the idea of a triumphal procession. This is an entry into a place uh, that makes every eye and every head turn to see what is going on. And when Paul talked about his life, he said that Jesus leads him in a triumphal procession everywhere that he goes. Maybe another way we could understand what a triumphal procession is, is that after a national championship, whether it be football or basketball or baseball or whatever, uh, when, the, when the team comes home from the game, they come home to a, a parade like no other. The city turns out and there's confetti and there's music and there's a parade through town to declare a victory has been won. And that's what Paul is talking about. He said that God, Christ leads us in a triumphal procession, that everywhere we go, we are uh, spreading this message that a victory has been won. There is a mighty prince who has come, and he has come to this world, and he has won the victory, and everything that he has done is to make people notice this. So, as we go out, we are still going in this spirit, spreading the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Another uh, way that he describes this is, is the aroma. Uh, not only like a triumphal procession, but he says uh, that, the, that we are an aroma. Uh, in, in these triumphal processions in, in Paul's day, one of the things that would happen is uh, as they were coming in, they would burn incense. And this incense would be a smell uh, that would just waft over the air and it would go throughout the city and people would smell it and they would understand and they would know uh, what this was for. But this incense gave off a very strong aroma uh, and it was, it was to let people know that a victory had been won. Paul uses this, this very... Um, powerful image to, to help people understand that when we go around, we, we present an aroma. We, we uh, come across to people. And, and he goes to the point to say that we come across in one of two ways. Sometimes we smell like life, like we're around people and the witness and the testimony and the words that we say resonates with them and they believe and those people become Christians. But then there's sometimes we're around people and we, uh, the, the words that we say and the witness that we give and the, the scripture that we speak does not register with them and it smells like death to them. So Paul says there's a reaction in the heart of people uh, whenever we go out on this triumphal procession. Some recognize the victory and recognize Jesus as the Lord of lords and the King of kings and some people don't. To some people, the message that we take brings eternal life and ultimate glorification. To others, it is a stumbling stone of offense that brings eternal death. 
as we go out, we, we need to keep in mind that every person that we come in contact, everything that we say or do is influencing people in one of two directions. We are either influencing people towards faith in Jesus Christ and eternal glory or towards rejection of Christ and eternal judgment. C.S. Lewis uh, said, said this, that in uh, a very famous set of sermons that were compiled into a book called The Weight of Glory. He says, It is in light of these overwhelming possibilities. It is with the awe and the circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all of our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. Everywhere we go, we need to be considering, knowing the fact that we are here to spread the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, we don't know the impact that our words will have, but we must say them. The gospel is powerful. Powerful enough to change a terrorist bent on your destruction. Have you ever considered that the Apostle Paul would have probably been considered a terrorist by the early church? He was bent on destroying the church, shutting it down everywhere he went to the point that the disciples were afraid of him. But Jesus appeared to him and the Word of God had an impact on his heart and it changed the, the heart of a man bent on the destruction of Christianity. How many people are out in our world today may seem bent on the destruction of Christianity whose lives might be changed by the power of the Word of God spoken by you to them. God did it in the life of the Apostle Paul. He did it in my life and He can do it in the lives of people all around us. 't only do we need to know that we are spreading the knowledge of Jesus everywhere we go, we also need to know that when we speak, we can share sufficiently. Now <clears throat> here's a word that, that appears uh, in chapter two and in chapter three. Paul says, as he, he is talking about this idea of us speaking uh, the, these truths to people that are around us, uh, he, he asks the question, who is sufficient for these things. Now, thinking, the, these hard conversations, who is sufficient, who is competent would be another word that we might use. Who is able to have these kinds of conversations? Paul, Paul is asking the question. He's saying, who has the wisdom and the strength and the, the logic and all the things that are needed in order to be able to have these conversations? And, and we all kind of fall into this category. We feel overwhelmed with the spirit uh, of the things that, that need to be said. But then he comes back in, in chapter 3 and he, he talks uh, about it, uh, that, that we do have sufficiency. But where does this life-giving comfort come from that comforts people in the depths of despair? Where does the power come from that changes somebody's heart when they are saved? Where does the conviction come from that convinces a person to repent of their sins? It does not come from us. Now, this is where I want us to really pay attention. Now, we, we do have a tendency maybe sometimes to step away and say, well, I can't make any difference. I can't do anything about that. So, not my circus, not my monkeys. I'm going to step away from the drama. But here, here is something Paul said, that it's not my wisdom. It's God's wisdom. Now, uh, he, he talked about preaching the gospel in, uh, in chapter 1. And, and he says that uh, uh, in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 2, actually, he says uh, that the gospel seems foolish to people who are perishing. The wisdom of God seems like foolishness. But he says he, he preaches this foolishness and himself appears to be a fool and that God uses the foolish and weak things of this world to shame those who are strong and seem to be wise in this world's eyes. And it says the reason that, that it does this is that so that no human might boast in the presence of God. 
The, the things that we speak is not us. So it's not our sufficiency that we are dealing with, but it is the sufficiency of the Word of God and the wisdom of God that He has shared with us. Paul said a lot of hard things to a lot of people. He, he addressed issues that, that are, are very, very much things that we don't want to talk about. There was a situation in 1 Corinthians where Paul wrote to the church and there, there was a, a, a man who, who was in the church at Corinth who was living a very immoral lifestyle. And Paul wrote a letter and he said, you know, it's to the point that you should expel this wicked brother. You should remove him from your presence and not allow him to be a part of your community anymore. And apparently, the church took action on it. And they, they took this, this church discipline seriously. But something happened. In the process of this church discipline, this man decided to repent of his sins. And he gave up this immoral lifestyle that he was living. And now he comes back in 2 Corinthians, the first couple uh, verses of chapter 2, and, and he says that this man is so heartbroken over what he has done that he is at the point of being uh, excessively sorrow, sorrowful about the situation that was in his life. And he tells the people at Corinth, he said, you need to reaffirm your love for him so that he is not overwhelmed by guilt and he is not overwhelmed by the shame of his sin. He tells them they need to... Welcome him back in and love him. And uh, we see this in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 4. He says it is out of affliction and anguish uh, of heart, and, uh, but also in abundant love. Uh, that when we share, we, we need to share through the spirit of love, but we need to speak the truth in love, as the book of Ephesians says. The last thing we need to know this morning is that when we speak, we can speak with authority. Uh, we, 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 we're spreading the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We are, we are sharing, uh, we can share sufficiently to uh, make a difference in people's lives, but we can have authority. We may live our lives afraid. And this is, this is me. This is preaching to Danny. We may live our lives afraid of how our conversations might go, but we can know, we can have confidence in the words that we say when they are based in the truth of the Scripture. Paul says uh, here, he says, We are not like so many peddlers of God's Word, but we are men of sincerity, commissioned by God in the sight of God. We speak in Christ. And what is he saying there? He's saying that there are a lot of people who stand up and the, the things that they say are not true. And the things that they say are not right. Uh, and he uses this word peddler, a peddler of God's Word. And by, by this, he, he's kind of talking about somebody who... Uh, is kind of fraudulent in their business dealings. It's somebody who, who is trying to sell things that don't live up to their reputation. Uh, uh, some of the uh, words that we would use to uh, describe somebody like this is a fraud, a quack, a charlatan. Uh, there used to be a phrase years ago that uh, uh, it'd be a snake oil sales, salesman. Anybody familiar with that? Uh, phrase. Uh, they don't call them snake oils anymore. They call them essential oils now. Um, uh, or uh, used car salesman kind of has a, a negative connotation to it, doesn't it? That you, you've got somebody trying to sell you something that, that has obviously got problems with it, but, but they're presenting it in such a way that it makes it look like it's the best thing ever. Paul is saying we're not like these people. We are not peddlers of God's Word, but we are men commissioned by God and sent by God with a message. He, said, he uses the word sincere. We are men of sincerity. Uh, the Latin, Latin uh, sincere comes from a Latin word, which literally translated means without wax. And uh, you may ask, well, what, how in the world does sincere come from without wax? So imagine, if you will, that the, you know, they didn't have you know, aluminum and stainless steel and copper pots like we do today. They had pottery. Uh, and uh, this pottery that they had uh, would, would uh, be what they cooked and they stored things in. And uh, 
in the day, uh, if, you, if, a, if a guy made a, a clay pot and baked it in the, the kiln, uh, sometimes in the drying process, there would be a crack in the pot. Now, once it's baked in the oven and it's dried and there's a crack in it, there's no use for it. So what would happen is that these, these uh, potters would fill the crack with wax. And as they, as they would like cover it up and fill these cracks with wax and sell it, uh, the people would think that they're buying a good product and when they would get home and heat it up, the wax would melt and run out and they would realize they had been taken. Paul is saying we're, we're not like that. We are sincere. We are without wax. We are true uh, in the things that we say. We are sent and commissioned. And he says down in chapter 3, verse 4, it says, such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient or competent or able in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from Christ. Where do you gain the authority? Where do you gain the power? Where do you gain the confidence to speak boldly in hard times in life? It comes through the power and the wisdom of God. It comes through knowing what the Scripture has said, how God has addressed the problems that we're facing, and by speaking it. I want to say this morning, we all need to learn the skills that are necessary to speak to all the situations of life with the truth of the Scripture in love, like the Scripture says, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. As a church, this should be our goal. We need a church full of people who are able to do this. I mean, think about it. There is far more opportunity to get the life-changing message of the Scripture into the lives of people when we leave this place and speak about the glories of Christ to a lost and hurting and sinning world. In the pages of the Bible, we do not find a program that God details to help people deal with the issues that they are dealing with. What God does describe is a kind of people that He wants us to be. We should be motivated by the love and the grace of God, empowered by the Spirit of God, and speaking the Word of God. And as we go with a heart set on loving God and other people, and a mind that is seeking to know and understand the truth of God, we will speak with the power of God to the hardest situations of life. Let's bow our heads and I want to have a word of prayer. I'm going to ask our musicians to go ahead and be making their way forward. God, I know in this room there, there are a whole lot of hard things that are going on in people's lives. And if we went to the jobs and the extended families and the the sports teams and the different involvements that we have all around. Lord, the, the hard situations and hard circumstances are on every side. God, I pray that you would fill your people this morning with wisdom from your word. That we would know how you would respond to each of these situations. I pray that you'd give us a heart of love, that we would be able to share the truth in love, not out of a sense of self-righteousness or condemnation, but Lord, that we would want better for all the people around us according to your word. And God, I pray that you would give us open doors of opportunity to speak these things in the lives of the people that are around us. So Lord, we come to you this morning. We ask these things that you would work during this time in our hearts. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.